This is uh, Woodturner's Coffee Hour number 134. It's January 12th, 2023. And I see on my screen uh, 37. Um, I expect a few more I'll click in. We usually get into the low 40s on this thing. Um, I have a couple of quick announcements. Saturday, this coming day after tomorrow, is the regular monthly Lancaster Woodturner's Open Shop at our club space in New Holland. Um, you're welcome to show up there if you're anywhere in the area from 9 to noon. Um, there will be demos. Uh, you can demo, you can watch, you can kibitz, you can drink coffee and yak. Um, if there's something you would like to see demoed, you let me or Barry know and we'll see if we can mobilize somebody to do it. Last time we had uh, as many experts as, as students and it was really quite fun. Um, so we've got experts, experts uh, guys like Angelo who is one of the best turners around and Ray. Uh, they're ready to show you whatever it is you'd like to know, uh, and uh, it's it's a good fun good morning good good yakety yak. Uh, you'll be there this week, Ray. Ray says, "Yeah." Anybody else on screen is going to be there besides Barry? Give me just this kind of hand so I can get a quickie look. One, no, Bill Major, Peter Caddick, Toby Booter. Okay, good start. Uh, Ziegler, are you going to go? Ziegler as well. Good. See some more people clicking on. Uh, the next club meeting is February 7th, I believe. Um, I'm not sure what the demo is. Uh, Barry, do you know? You have to unmute. Give me a second. It's going to be uh, Mike Kuderbach with his... Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Those, uh, strange it's a strange that he makes. It's a spherical yeah, yeah. right. A little spherical toy. It's very, a rolly thing. Yes. It, it, uh, there you go. It's a very. He makes it very precise. He's yeah. We watched him do it a couple of weeks last at last open shop, and uh, he makes a temp. It, 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 he did the whole thing. He drew the template. He cut the template out. He made the pieces to the template. He twisted them and glued them together, and he made the. It came out perfect, uh, and it, it, it. I was surprised at how carefully he fiddled his way right to exactly the template. He was not going to let any. You know, he wanted it perfect, and he got it perfect uh, by just carefully cutting and holding the template up and cutting again. I've seen Angelo do that as well, and I've learned how to do it myself sometimes. It's really a good way to work when you're trying to make something accurate. So anyway, we'll see that at the February 7th Lancaster meeting. Um, and just to look ahead, the March Lancaster meeting will feature Ernie Conover, but I'm not sure what he's going to demo. Uh, we were talking about that this morning. In fact, uh, we can poll this group right here and see. Uh, you, you got it. We're going to have Ernie um, on uh, at the March meeting. What would you like him to show you? He's got a lot of stuff up his sleeve, so you don't have to all speak at once right now. You can just drop me a note or put it in the chat, and I'll pass it along. Anybody else with announcements? Um, I think Randy is going to click in from the farm show. We've been hearing about the farm show for quite a few weeks now. Um, I think they're there this morning. Uh, Toby, I'm surprised you're not there. Or maybe you are. No? <laughs> no, I'll be there this afternoon. Oh, okay. Have you been there yet? Did you do a stint yet? Yes, I did Saturday and Tuesday. And I'll do today and then Saturday again. Was it fun? Oh, yeah. Lots of fun. And uh, how The best the part is make, making something while they watch, and then at the end... You give it to one of the little kids, and, uh, and everybody's happy. It's great. What kind of crowds do you get? Usually, when I was doing it, uh, 6 to 12, maybe, people stand and watch. And so is the farm show crowd like it used to be, or is it uh, dwindled down on account of COVID? Or? Oh, no, it's it's been tremendous this year it's compared to the last couple of years, yeah. They didn't stop people, for COVID. All the, ven the vendors... The vendors that I've talked to have been selling out. They, they're just belated. <laughs> oh, really? Well, that's nice to hear. Uh, so anybody in PA, that's in Harrisburg, and that's on. That's still on through this through this weekend, isn't it? Into next week, or is it end this weekend? This Saturday is the last day. Saturday is the last day. Okay, so that's the farm show. Anybody else with announcements? Okay. Um, this is a show and tell, and I see some lovely hands up here. Um, I also had a, a thought that I'd like to hear from some people who we don't hear from. We've got a whole screen full of people who come here now, or some people anyway, who we don't really know what they make. So 
Um, I'm, I'd like to extend an invitation to anybody who has not shown us pictures of their work or has not, you know, been okay to hold work up and talk about it. I can't do that with my background. Um, I'd like to invite you to, to do that. We'd like to get to know you, and it's fun. And uh, you get good comments, and people get to see you. I mean, I see Tim Sieber there with a plate in the background that I didn't know you made that kind of stuff, Tim. So I'd like to see, uh, you know, I'd like to hear from people we haven't, uh, we haven't heard from here before. That's part of what makes this fun is participation. And I'd like to encourage you to uh, stick your, do your raise hand and uh, bring on pictures or just bring work and show us work. Um, and with that, anybody else got anything they want to say before I start uh, handing the floor over to other guys? Okay. I'm going to give Don the floor. We haven't had Don, heard from Don for quite a while. All right. Thank you, John. Um, I missed last week due to uh, problems with the uh, input to my computer and... Uh, I think John, the week before, did the pillbox. Well, I'd like to just show you the one that I've made from his uh, piece. And it's just one uh, magnet. Oh, you've got magnets in there. Hold it up so we can see it. We, we can't quite see it. There we go. There we're seeing some of it. The, there's the magnet by Over my little Over there, finger. yes. Yeah, that, that method and, works. And one magnet in the edge. Yep. Yep. And it goes right through. Ah, nice. So you've only got one magnet in there. And of course, it will only go one way. Yep. As you rightly know, because the. Yep. But what that won't do is so spit, it won't spit it off. That's the piece of you. It won't throw it. Was, away. It won't throw it away. It won't spit it off though. But if you if you want to have it so it won't go on any other way, it won't be there at all. Yeah, but that's a nice that's design you have there. It's a nice piece. It looks like a yo-yo. Well, what I tried to do was, and I put two separate, two different woods as a little dowel in the top of each of them. Hold it up a little but more. Hold it up. Hold it up a little them, higher. Yeah, there you go. When I polished them, they came out the same color. <laughs> I, I intended to do a white one and a dark one for AM and PM. Uh. <laughs> I made a mistake, but never mind. It's the first one I'd done and it was inspired by you, John. So thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you. I've had a number of people contact me about that. Who, uh, a, yeah. One guy left a really nice comment on one of the videos saying he was going to rush out and buy some magnets right away. So. I've always thought it was uh, something deserving of wider, wider utility than we've seen so far. Yeah. Well, these magnets were five millimeters by eight, and they are, the pull strength is 0.91 kilograms. And that's pretty good. The other thing is that I made for Christmas was a competition piece, which was a necklace. Hmm. Now, and it got highly commended. Now those are beads, turned beads, yeah? They're all beads. Now, Everyone's how, a different size bead. Now how did you turn those? Uh, I started off with a spindle piece of wood and then drilled through and turned each one to size, parted off, then turned the next one and then so on and so forth. So did and you... then I put the little beads, which is ebony, the little one in the middle there. There we are. Yeah. Um, they're all the same size, except for the two at the end where the link is, and they are a ball one. Did you drill them on the lathe before you turned them? I or drilled after? them on the lathe before I turned them. So... Drilled, then turned, parted off, drilled, turned, and I got the whole length done. That's a good way to do it. So did you do two different spindles, like the large one and a small one? Uh, yeah. The uh, When I started, I, I think I have got up to about uh, one, two, three, yeah, about four different sizes, and then I went to a smaller piece and turned the smaller ones. 
Uh, Did you support him with a tailstock spindle while you after you drilled him? Nope. It wasn't that long a piece, as you can see. If I put it like that, that's about uh, four inches. So as you parted it off, it got smaller and smaller, and therefore I was okay. Well, that's as long as you don't get a catch. If you get a catch, it'll rip it out of the chuck. <laughs> it would do, but... Uh, but you don't get catches, I know. I don't like get you. catches. <laughs> <laughs> I did some beats about 10 years ago. Mike Peace has got a great idea on his website or YouTube where you make a couple of pointed uh, pieces of uh, metal and, and a holder to put it in a chalk can in the tailstock. So you drill them and then put them on the points and then turn them. It works great. I did some for my granddaughter. Wait a minute. It was I, a lot of fun. I don't, up bits of wood. I don't follow that. Uh, try it again. What you Tell us again what you did, what so you're saying. you've got... Two uh, two metal pieces, say, I don't know what it was, maybe, I used quarter-inch drill rod, I think, and put a point on each one. So the one on the headstock is mounted into a little block that goes in a chuck. And then on the tailstock, I I can't remember exactly uh, how I did it. I think I have pictures of it somewhere, but I'd have to find them. Uh, could bring it up next week. But it might, it's on Mike's website, and it works really great. Is Mike here this morning? I don't know. I haven't seen them. So that's that's a way of turning the bead with you're using tiny little bits of wood using up wee wee scraps. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I so always, he chucked the number one jaws and drilled them and then uh, and then mounted them and turned them. That's a good idea. I, I finally over the after years and years of keeping all those little bits of wood, I decided to start chucking them out. But I know that Angelo would scold me for that. Uh, he, he keeps, he feels an obligation to turn every piece of wood that comes into his hands. I'd turned uh, them in jam chunks for years, uh, good size beads, uh, or maybe that big around. And I used to put them on a big piece of string beside my lathe at my old shop. And I always said at the end of the demo, I was trying to turn enough to make a car seat for the summer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what size chisel do you guys use for something that small? Like, Don, when you were turning that, what size? I was si using a 3 8 spindle gouge. A uh, 3 8 really? That's okay. what I would use, too, 3 8 spindle gouge, absolutely. You could turn do you anything. you use a long uh, uh, fingernail grind, though? Yes, I do, Ernie. Yeah, yeah. That's I believe in that grind. You can actually do it with a half inch yeah. if yeah. you've got a long grind on it. Yeah, Raffin is absolutely right. You can with a three eighths or a half inch spindle gouge, nice and sharp. You could turn anything. Yeah, I have the Bonnie over Klein there. grind that I absolutely love. We hosted Bonnie in 2010, and uh, hers is more 45 hand hand ground, not on. Well, I remember Bob Stocksdale, who was, you know, a pioneer in this and one of the best turners ever. Uh, that's, a, that's all he ever used was his was a 3.8 spindle gouge, and all he ever made was bowls. So he used it as a bowl gouge, and uh, work, work, I do that too. Works pretty well. Uh, bowl gouge is great, but you can, get, you can get, the same, get the same action out of a good spindle gouge. You just have to remember to keep the bevel behind the cut. But uh, yeah. if you were going to be marooned on a desert island with one turning tool, uh, a spindle gouge would be the tool you can do anything with a spindle gouge, actually. Yeah, you can rough, rough out, turn spindles, turn bowls, whatever. So do you, do you drag your spindle gouge sideways to rough out? I do. No. <laughs> no. I go straight in from the back. If I'm doing the back of the bowl from the tailstock end, I come round from the outside going in. But I usually use a uh, half inch bowl gouge. Or... Yeah, I don't, I don't use a spindle gouge to rough out, but I see Jim's face, a 3A seems large, but you can make really, really tiny finials with a 3A inch spindle gouge. Um, and the problem is if you go to a smaller one, the tool loses its rigidity most of the time. So when you go to a quarter inch spindle gouge, you just don't have the rigid tool. But you can go to a really small diameter with a three eighths inch spindle gouge. I quite agree with you, Bruce. It's um, what I find is with the smaller ones, you tend to lose the ability to hold it to the wood. 
it, it wants to go under it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Instead of does. sitting in the centre, it wants to always lose itself underneath the wood. So yeah, it's three eighths be much. better. Yeah. Or or even a small half-inch skew will give you a lovely finish on a, a, a very fine finial. So, so here we are now with like, I have dozens of turning tools, literally dozens, and quite a lot of them are tools that have never been seen before this recent upsurge. So are we just like victims of merchants looking for things to sell us, or do we actually need this enormous variety of tools? No, it's, you, you, you're caught up in the, the throes of one, you see something demonstrate, you think, I must have that, and you go and buy it. And Turning. if you get on, you realize you don't need them all. Turning's been gentrified. There's now a tool for every purpose. I, I agree with Raffin, like uh, the negative rake scraper is the biggest ripped off in history as far as I'm concerned, because you just walk over to a grinder and grind it and have a negative rake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, um, well, that's a, that's a question I've been having about negative rake scrapers, because I like them. I use them. Uh, and it, but they don't work if the angle between the top bevel and the other bevel is more than 90 degrees. You have to have it less than 90 degrees by a bit, I think. And I'd like some of you experts to straighten me out if I'm wrong about that. Mine, you, mine's about uh, 10 degrees. Oh. Well, Did you guys get the Wood magazine? There was a, a letter from a wife of Wood Turner. And she she was chastising the magazine for uh, offering an article about metal turning. She said, the last thing my husband needs is to be holding a cold piece of steel in his hand. Let him hold the wood and work with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, in a scraper, you have the normal grind on a normal scraper is really what a machinist would call clearance. Yes. All you're looking for in that edge is enough clearance. In fact, people that turn alabaster and stone will grind them dead square. And since you're pointing it downhill, you can get 15 degrees of clearance in it. Yeah. And then you can flip it over and use it again before you turn around and put it to the grinder where it's you've placed right behind your lathe because you sharpen every two or three minutes. But so you have the clearance and then the top grind in it is just enough to get it so it's taking a dragging cut on the center line and the whole purpose of a negative rake scraper is to be able to go into something deep and stay dead on the center line all the way up yeah. so you're looking for enough clearance in the bottom to avoid healing out on the bevel and enough rake in the top to give it what you normally turn your scraper to if you're tipping it. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Well, really, you can get away with half a dozen tools. What about a badan? How many of you guys use a badan? Do you know what a badan is? The, the French use it. The badan is a is like a skew with only one bevel, uh, a narrow. So, John, skew. I use that for sizing, like on uh, tenons. Uh, it works very well for that. I've not used it as a true bidet yet. I'm, it's on my list to learn. I had one that I tried to use, and all I could do was make a mess with it, so I put it aside. I championed it in my youth, but it really doesn't do anything a beating and parting tool doesn't do, and you have one less tool that way. There was a song written about it, Bob, 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 Badan. <laughs> <laughs> Although the badan works works excellent for making beads, it's quick and easy and has a large enough cross section that you get very little uh, vibration. It's basically like a really really thick skew, and for making beads, it's so slick because there's no 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 catches. You just lay it on the wood, twist it, and your beads done. Well, so which way up do you use it? Uh, if I'm doing beads, I've got the tapered part. So the tapered part would be up. Bevel up. But if I'm peel yeah, if I'm peeling, then I flip it over and use it like a parting tool. And it works great for that as well. But for making beads, I leave the bevel up and then roll it, uh, just roll it either way. And it it's a universal tool. I mean it's great. It, it is a specialty tool. I don't use it very often, but when I need it, I'm just glad to have it. Well the European I'd like turners to see a good it. demo. 
I'd like to see a good demo on that. But uh, because I, I, I like the sound of the tool bedan, that sounds really cool. So I bought one, but I never used it. So, but what I like to see is somebody give me a demo on it. Is there any good demos out there? No, but I, I think, think I could probably go to the shop and make one. Is there is a good with, demo. Give me a second and I'll find it and put it in the comments. With John's theme, I have one in my drawer that I don't use. But there is more than one flavor of Bedan, right? There is the French version, which is different. Um, so then there could be two tools you leave in your box and don't use. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. How is the French one different from what? I, I, I thought the French one was the only one there was. So what do you mean? No, there's two kinds, I think. The English or Japanese one or something? There is two. The bottom one is tapered, one narrow. is straight. So if you go in uh, and do a, a plunge cut, you've got, it'll free up, you know, just like a, a diamond uh, parting tool. It's like a parting tool. The shape is tapered yeah. in. Uh, yeah. I bought one on, just happened to see it on the shelf at Woodchuckers a long, long time ago, and it sat for years. I started using it. I use it. I'll grab it before I can grab the parting tool when I want to make a tenant now. You guys are going to have us all filling our toolbox at the end of this session today. And you are not saying we only need one. <laughs> well, since we're having this conversation, what about hook tools? Who uses hook tools? I tried it, and oh my gosh, what a bite. <laughs> I think Ray... I have both, Ray... Uh, Mike House Alex and uh, Andre... Uh, what the heck is his name? Montreal from Quebec. Martel. Uh, Martel. I have both of them. Kusilak uses uh, uh, hook tools as well. Yeah. They're really, they are really hog wood. How many of you use the ring tool? I, that's what I mean, the hook tool, the ring tool, yeah. Yeah. They, I, I'm afraid yeah, of it. I don't like it. I yeah, I'm afraid of it. I tried it and it gave me a Dickens. <laughs> At the same time, those new carbide tools with the cup carbide on them, that's basically the same tool. I mean, it's the same same perfectly round end on it with a with a sharpened top edge and a bevel, an inside bevel, so I don't know. But it, it's limiting because of the depths. With the ring tool or a hook tool, you got to control it. But once you master it, they hog wood like crazy. Yeah. I that watched termite the one is a ring tool that I use a lot on the end grain, and it works very well. Yeah, yeah. but it do doesn't the 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 one way uh, uh, ring tool doesn't work very good in wet wood. It works great in dry wood, but the hole's too small to get a chip through if you get into uh, serious wet wood. Yeah, Ernie's right, and and that's the termite is from one way. It it does work very well in dry wood, or it can't be too oily either. It would, it would jam. Oh. The ring tools are just a hook tool made by modern manufacturing methods. You either investment cast the head or you turn it in a uh, screw machine and weld it to a shaft. Yeah. So I'd That's like, the can, I show, uh, can I show my, I have a hook tool that I make. And bring, it, it, bring it back. The, and, uh, yeah, there we can see it now. Talk again, you'll get the way I, the way I make it is with O1 steel, and I grind. I use the grinder, so I grind it first, and then I bend it, and then end up with this and with some just basic um, hardening and tempering techniques. It it. It pulls the wood. Usually I use it on end grain and I've used it mostly for um, lampshades because you can get really thin wood. You can turn very thin with it. And the, the way it was explained to me is if you were to take your uh, bowl gouge and hollow from the inside out, which is basically what you're doing if you have a lampshade type cone, the shaft of the tool would be on the other end of the lathe going through the side if you used the bowl gouge. So basically what it is, is if you were to cut the end of your bowl gouge off, turn it 90 degrees and weld it to the end of a stick, that's what we have here. So how hard is that to learn to, learn to use? It is not hard because if you understand how a bowl gouge is, is working, this is a bowl gouge on the end of a 90 degree, um, stick 
So if you took a bowl gouge, here's your bowl gouge, and you wanted to come, and you had a, uh, a um, say this is the inside of your, your um, lampshade, if you wanted to cut it the right way, you would have to be cutting it from inside out, meaning your shaft goes through the side of the lampshade. You can't go like this. It has to come like this for bevel rubbing. So if you take your hook tool, it is, it is the end of your bowl gouge on it, mounted on a 90 degree, you know, kind of, and it just rides the bevel right out and shavings just flow out. They just, they shoot across the room, just like if you were using a bowl gouge where you see people shoot shavings across the room. But it's, it really is, it's a bevel rubbing cut. The end of it is a bowl gouge mounted 90 degrees to a rod. Well, see, so there we are with another tool to buy or make. No, 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 you make them. That's the nice part about it. Now, do you bend that with an acetylene torch? Nope, no, what I did was, I, I drilled two uh, in a stump. I drilled two hole because I had, I think this is five, I don't know, five sixteenths and, uh, or three eighths, three eighths. I, so I drilled two holes in the end of a stump and I drove two of the, because I had the bar. This is a O1 tool steel. Um, so I drove two, two rods in the end of the stump and then I heated this up and I put it in there and I just bent it around to a hook. Now, what did angle? you did you draw it to straw after you tempered it? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So you, so the tempering is that whole funny part about it. it's such a mystery. And for what we're doing, I don't feel we need to take this to the nth degree and have NASA do our hardening for us and all that kind of stuff. If you heat it up to non-magnetic, quench it, take it out, buff it up a little bit, and you you play a torch on it, you'll watch the color changes, and and just just as it's hitting straw, you quench it again, and you have a, a workable tool. Are you quenching in oil or water? Um, I'm quenching in oil. It's O1. Yeah. You know, so I'm quenching in oil. What angle? What angle is that? It looks sharper than most bowl gouges. Well, you cut it. The it, bevel it, angle. So what I do is I first get a flat going on on one end, and that's easy enough on a grinder. And then I turn it and I use a stick to push the the flat to hold the flat so it doesn't rotate anymore. And then I get this end, and it is. Um, it's about twenty five degrees to me. Yeah, it's it's fairly steep. It's certainly not fifty five of a bowl gouge, but it 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 works. So that's what I'm and I'm I have to admit I am using it on green wood. What's your heat source? For for just the basic working? No what's your, what's your heat source to heat it to uh sparking in you know uh um, uh just just map gas because it's such a small area and i'm not i don't really feel the need of a forge i can get this whole piece to glow the nice um non-magnetic um you know i hang a magnet and so i i heat it i know you don't want to blister it because you can you can burn the carbon out of it but so I just I bring it up to temperature, wave it if, as long as the magnet doesn't move, then I'm good to go and I quench it and then buff it out so you can see it and then play the torch. Well, after you bend it, all this is really done. You know, you kneel it first so you can bend it yeah. and, and then you harden it and then temper it. But it, it's I guess the idea when I try to show this to people and and, and teach people this it's not a uh mystery it's not unobtainable it's something that we can all do are you annealing in air or do you put it in line no when i anneal it the idea is the annealing is just so i can 
yeah. sharpen it. So I don't need, I don't, it's, as long as I can get a file, you know, the, the skate test. Yeah. Well, if it skates, it's annealed. And I, I mean, if it, if it bites, it's annealed. I, and then I, I use my grinder. Well, if you, uh, if you put it in wood ashes, believe it or not, work just about as well as lime and it slows down that cooling. So you get a more full anneal. Right. Okay. However, I'm not hand filing it, so I don't really feel I need it to I, be a perfect anneal. Yeah. Which Except goes back to do we have to do everything precisely like a a real metallurgist or knife maker or all those other people who say, oh, no, you have to bring it to uh, 1342 and a half degrees for 27 minutes, blah, 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 blah. I just don't feel that that's a i mean that's all true that's all true but to anneal it the way i do it and use the grinder works to bring it up to non-magnetic and quench it so the file skates yeah. on it that works so just a second here now what i'd like to really we got three things here i'd like to see a somebody make a little five minute video about using a badan i'd like to see a little five minute video about using a hook tool and I'd like to see a little five-minute video about what you just said, hardening and tempering the steel rod. I've read about that a million times. And I've heard guys talk about it just the way you just did a million times. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't quite understand do how to do I'll it. Do it. I'll do it. I'd, I'd love to do it. We have a small five-minute demonstration. It's, it is not a mystery. I'd it like could be. If you want it to be, people can baffle you with bullshit. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's what's happened to me. I would love it if you just give me the, the five-minute demo. You want to do that next week or the week after? I would love to do that. But let me show you the bedan. I learned, I got this from Jean-Francois Esculon himself. Oh, I have one of those, too. The first thing that he teaches you about the bedan is merde. What? What? Merde. Ah, yes. That's his shit in French. And the idea is you're going to get, you're going to have to use that word an awful lot. But yeah, that's, I, I took a class with him at Aramont and had a great time. So that's my, I bought this from him. And, well, that's uh, tapered, that that's shank, my, right? No, it just looks like that from the, from the. Oh, it's the camera. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's the camera. But this is the square one, not the trapezoid one. So hey. it's all. It's square. It's a square bar, not the trapezoid one. Hey, Clifton, what is this magic of a, you say non-magnetic? Are you hocus pocusing a magnet over your metal? And what's that telling you? That that's a very, um, it's a, it's a known part of hardening. So if you hang a magnet on a string and then you heat metal while you wave it, it if it cools, it becomes magnetic again, but at a certain temperature, it's non-magnetic. And that's a crucial temperature is changing the austenite. And, and if I yeah. do the little video, I'll do it a little bit yeah. better. Okay. But it that lets you know that you're at this, a, a certain temperature. And that's a, that's a, a known thing that people do. So it's not any, again, it's not magic, it's just, how, how metal behaves. I'm going to pull the plug on this right now because it's a great conversation and we filled half the hour with it. We got some other people who want to show us other stuff. But Clifton, I would be I delighted to have a little video come along about that or a I live demo. But I'll, I'll come up with something and do a five minutes at the most. That'd be great. That'd be great. And I'll, I'll do that through an email with you so you know what it's going to be. That'd be great. I like that a lot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Sorry, for the, uh, sorry so, to take up that time. No, no, I love it. I'm grateful for the information. It's terrific information. I'm just going to move it along now uh, because we got it, we need to see it to get it, or I do anyhow. I've heard I've heard that speech a bunch of times, and I don't get it. <laughs> so, uh, Roger, what do you, uh, Roger? We haven't heard from you. I think you're you, you've been with us a bit, but uh, what would you like to t show us today? Yeah, John, you're right. It's been a while since I've showed you guys anything, so I've got just a few pictures I thought I would share and maybe have a little discussion over this. Uh, you got to bring it up now. We're only, first, seeing, we're only seeing your directory so far. We're not seeing the picture. You're not seeing it? We're seeing so I've got it. thumbnails only. 
Mm. What you have to do is bring one of them up before you share. Bring one of them up yeah, to full so screen and then share by double clicking it. So you see it full screen and then do the screen share. Uh, sorry, we're still not there. I'll tell you what, John, why don't you go on and come back to me? Um, okay, we'll do that. Thanks. Dave Delo. Hi. Hey, okay, let's try. Uh, <laughs> you usually get it right. You seem to know what to do. <laughs> the challenge of the month is get it right. Yeah. All right, how are we doing? Well, we're seeing you keep on turning. Okay. Um, I want to get that bigger. Yeah. There That's we go. good. That's what we want. You got it. Okay. Hey, I just wanted to uh, uh, show you a little bit about uh, a very inexpensive way. I uh, made a little bit of improvement in uh, my dust collection for, for fine dust. And just to give you an idea, uh, this is what I'm using. Uh, it's a two horsepower Grizzly with the filter on top and the clear bag. And I got the uh, uh, old uh, steel version of the uh, Dust Deputy Cyclone there uh, with the steel bottom. You know, you know if you've ever uh, read any of uh, Bill Pence's uh, fine dust collection uh, uh, gospel, uh, you know, he, he says, uh, you know, to be serious about fine dust collection, you got to be like uh, a five horsepower uh, uh, motor on, on your uh, dust collector and uh, the impeller needs to be, I, I forget exactly, but either 15 or 16 inches and uh, the uh, fins on that impeller need to be at a certain angle. And then you can start really uh, being serious about dust collection. Well, the doghouse that I have, uh, uh, my dust collector and uh, uh, air compressor and everything is uh, kind of limited height wise. So I, I can't do anything about that. Um, so th this is what I have to use. Okay. And over the years on the other end, you know, I've used a combination of, uh, the big gulp and then this, uh, uh, rectangular, uh, version. And I've used a four inch uh, pipe to just sticking out. And then this this piece here is uh, a four inch to uh, six inch uh, adapter that I've been using for the longest time, and it seems to work uh, the best uh, out of anything that I've uh, ever done. And you know, I realized that I I don't have the Cadillac Escalade of uh, dust collection. You know, I'm I'm down in the uh, Chevy Malibu area. Okay, um, so. And everybody, or a lot, most everybody else is probably in that same boat, you know. So then we uh, go to uh, some type of uh, mask or, uh, you know, Airstream or uh, a papper, okay, uh, to uh, take up the shortcomings of the uh, for fine dust collection. So I don't know, somewhere along the line, I came across this uh, idea of a bell mouth housing on the end of. Uh, the four inch and uh, uh, lo and behold, boy, this thing works extremely well. Uh, it's the best fitting that I've ever put on the end of this four inch uh, opening here. It really increases the velocity of, uh, you know, and I don't understand the quantum physics behind that, uh, but uh, it really uh, helps out greatly. So I've I had a couple, uh, uh, splices that I uh, used here to uh, uh, sort of get this uh, uh, f from my stand over to uh, the work piece and then uh, put this bell mouth housing on the end of it. And uh, so uh, are you trying I can to, use it. Are you to, trying uh, to get the dust or all the chips as well? No, just the dust. I, uh, you know, normally, you know, I'm pretty much a bull guy and working with wet wood and I don't turn the dust collector on until I either I'm twice turning or sanding. Okay. And so th this, uh, I can get this right up next to where I'm working. And, uh, like I say, it, it just, uh, it, it's improved me 
I've gone from the Chevy Malibu and now I'm up into the Buick uh, Le Sabre area, okay? Well, how, uh, how do you think that little bell shape is working? I can't quite see. Is, is it a taper, like a funnel, or is it straight? It's, it's, uh, there's a taper to it uh, from the inside. Uh, I don't know if you get a... Yeah, you, I don't have a picture, yeah. but that's tapered, and then it comes, comes out uh, at an angle, and the round angle, the radius there. Okay. Well, what's the and, what does the radius do? Does that help the dust somehow? The velocity, you know, when I uh, when I'm using a four that four to six inch uh, uh, adapter, uh, you can put your hand in there and you can feel the velocity. But once you get out towards the uh, six inch, it, you can tell the decrease in the velocity. So it's not. It's only sucking in maybe at about the five inch mark, okay? And everything else is just a waste. But here, uh, this entire area, uh, just uh, uh, of the opening, uh, sucks with very good velocity. And so I, I, I'm, I was really impressed. It's a $20 item I got off of uh, uh, Amazon and, uh, uh, you know, very well worth it. What's it? What's I it guess, called on Amazon? How do we find it? Uh, I'll I'll put a link in the chat. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and I'll okay. try and I don't always get the chat into the follow up, but I'll try and do that this week. And anyway, all you guys get the chat. So. And and I guess uh, these are these are four pieces I've done over the the last uh, uh, couple of weeks using that. And so after after th these two on the right, this uh, oak. And this sycamore, they were once turned bowls that I finished sanded. Uh, and then these, uh, this uh, Florida mahogany and the ambrosia maple are uh, uh, twice turned bowls. Okay, so uh, uh, so after using this for four four pieces, uh, I'm very happy with uh, the results of uh, the twenty dollar upgrade. Okay. Stu, Stu, you should comment on what you did with yours because it's very similar. Yeah, it is. I just basically made a, a uh, leather shroud that, that comes around. I don't think I got any pictures of it, but I'll see if I can come up with something. Or we could even go up to the shop here one day and and have a good look at it. Yeah, bring bring it one day to the to show. Uh, let's let's finish this. By the, by the way, on, on RC aircraft, that type of device is called the velocity stack, and it's used on the carburetors to improve. Yeah. That's that right. really. Yeah. That, uh, you did uh, some testing. You did that is absolutely too. correct. When we got that is absolutely uh, correct. If you, uh, too many people talking. Hang on a second here. I just wanted to show. Uh, 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 this sycamore bowl it wrinkled up uh, quite nicely. That's a nice if, shape. If you're that, into that, yeah. And uh, on these four pieces, I tried out a new finish of this Odie's oil, and uh, I, I there were um, basically a, a wipe on poly or a, a walnut oil uh, for finishing, but I, I wanted to try this out and. Uh, yeah, it's not too bad. It, it, easy to work with, and uh, uh, I'll probably use it again. That's all I got. Nice show. Thank you, Dave. Any questions Dave, for when Dave? When I do an epoxy, I use Odie's. It really clears up any uh, scratches on the epoxy. I love Odie's. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. the first time I ever used it, and I was you know, kind of pleased with it. Yeah, it's it's worth the forty four bucks for the for the jar, and you don't use all that much. And yeah, it's it kind of pricey. And... It is kind of pricey. Is it an oil yeah. finish or what is it? An oil or a var what do we got here anyway? It's an oil. It's an oil. It's an oil. It, how long does it take? It how many coats do you put on? How long does it take to dry? I I used two coats on each one of this. I really didn't see that much difference between one and two coats of it, and they they took about. Uh, a week, about five to seven days for it to dry out so that I could buff it. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, they they recommend one and they say if you really must, just because that's your personality, go ahead and put the second one on. But I don't. I use one coat and let her go. 
brief comment? Yeah. Uh, Dave, I got to give you credit for experimenting, and Ted nailed it when he called it a velocity. Uh, I, I call them a velocity stack. Uh, when you're trying to tune carburetors, you use different lengths, but the bell shape on top is exactly what you want for an omnidirectional vacuum in your case. Um, you can use different. Yeah, I'm sorry, <clears throat> Carl, you keep, you're fading in and out. Your e internet's not that shapes. Great. In fact, uh, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll let go. Thank you guys. <laughs> okay. Anybody else on that? Uh, <laughs> Barry? Um, as a former aeronautical engineer, uh, the, the bell mouth is the same as the intake on a, uh, if you, on a passenger jet engine, you notice the air intake for the engines is rounded in exactly the same way. And on sucking in air to the engine or into a vacuum, the air will make the curve. Uh, I mean, it doesn't just suck in straight if it has a curve that it can follow, uh, you know, our generous radius like the bell mouth is, the air will follow that. And there's a pretty famous video you can see on YouTube with uh, a Navy uh, aircraft mechanic being sucked into the air intake, and he is not standing in front of it. He is standing next to it, and that lateral ingestion of air is so fierce it has sucked him into the air intake of a of a carrier based uh, a6 fighter or intruder uh, so that the bell mouth just gathers air from all the way out to beyond 90 <coughs> degrees oh. Barry, is there a particular is there a particular curve that works best for that i'm sorry is there a particular curve that works best uh, experimentally in, uh, uh, in in aviation, you, you try to get it as as sharp as you can. But I would say for airflow that is starting off at zero speed, you know that which is lying outside the intake, versus uh, coming on you onto you like an airplane at four hundred miles an hour or something. Uh, I would. I'm surprised that the bell mouth is as small as uh, as that black one that I saw there. Normally, the radius I would I would guess to be like a, a two inch radius. You know, so it'd be like uh, the bell mouth outside diameter would be about uh, eight inches bigger than the pipe. So for a four inch pipe, Good. twelve inch to outside diameter on the bell mouth. Wow! I think I'll turn a couple and play with it. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do is turn them. I don't want. I don't need to spend twenty bucks for a piece of plastic that I can turn. I, I, I almost all of my dust fittings I've turned out of pear wood. It worked great. Actually, I found it on uh, Amazon, putting in four inch velocity stack, and it's nineteen ninety nine in aluminum. So, uh, yeah, you can make it or you can uh, push a button. Your choice. Velocity stack <laughs> is what it's called, eh? So we know that. It comes up as a name is X Auto Hawks A U T O H A U X four inch inlet. And it's clearly the part that he's got. Fantastic. Oh. Any more on this? Somebody's trying to also look at the intake well, but you can also look at the intake here on a turbocharger. Yeah, that would be the same thing. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move along. Bert, what do you got today? Okay, I, uh, what I've got today is I've got, uh, this was supposed to be a ball. And it's actually going to, it's an urn. So it's, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's supposed to be a ball. It was going to be a golf ball. But I learned something about segmenting when I did this. Uh, most importantly is uh, make a drawing. I didn't do a very good accurate drawing. And I used different thicknesses of wood on the rings. And of course, me being uh, impatient, I made all the rings and I had them sorted out. And then I started gluing them together. But because they're all different thicknesses, uh, nothing lined up like a globe. Once I got them 
uh, turned or got ready to turn them, uh, it wasn't a globe anymore. And this is only about an eighth of an inch thick here, so I can't go any any more to make it round. So I just left the shape the way it is and said, well, that's going to be that urn. And then I learned from one of our uh, wood turning uh, guys, uh, Bob Chap. He said, make a drawing. Yeah. Help you a lot. And so I, I made this drawing. And uh, what he was saying is once you make the drawing, you can always go back and actually measure the drawing to measure your wood when it's turning. And to make that even easier, turning the inside, I made myself a template. So now I've got a stack and I stack them on the, when I stack them on the lathe, these are all rough, but I, I only do half at a time, but I turn, now I'm gonna turn the inside to the template and then I'll turn the outside because by doing it with the template, I'll know where the inside is. I can measure the outside and uh, turn a perfect sphere because my end game is I wanna make this into a golf ball make it a golf ball urn. And then my second one's gonna be a baseball. So it's a, a kind of a sports related uh, uh, urn uh, uh, thing. I've, I've made some uh, curling rocks and I've made a basketball. And so I've, now I'm making a golf ball and a baseball. How are you gonna dimple the golf ball? I'm gonna index, I've, I've got a golf ball and I counted all the little holes on it and they don't line up. So the golf balls are not perfectly uh, uh, symmetrical, but I'm going to index a line on the center and I'm going to make the first row of dimples with a high speed, like a Fordham or something like that, and index one set of uh, holes around it. And then after that, I'm going to go freehand because a golf ball, they're not all the same size. Some are bigger, some are smaller, and they don't always follow a straight line. So I'm going to make the first one a straight line and then I'm just going to go around it and just touch it and see what happens. Now, the reason for that, the dimples, is almost the same as the bell thing that we're talking about. It's to control the airflow on that moving thing. That's what I, when I did the research. They said there's two kinds of dimples, one's for distance and one's for control. So I'm going to, I don't know which one I'm going to put on this thing. Well, I don't, <laughs> do you really think anybody cares? <laughs> well, at that point, I, I probably don't care anymore. It's but, called uh, <laughs> I can explain the dimples too, if you like. Go for it, Barry. Well, yeah. Uh, uh, a smooth ball or a smooth anything rotating through the air, and there are a lot of people might not know, but a golf ball can be rotating upwards of uh, 5,000 RPM at launch. Um, and when it goes through the air, there is an ad one side of the golf ball is advancing and one side is retreating if you will, so that uh, one side of the golf ball, let's say at a hundred mile an hour flight is experiencing 200 miles per hour surface speed. The opposite side is only facing pretty much zero velocity airspeed. And that difference in airspeed uh, because of something called the Magnus effect causes it to curve the famous golfer's slice or hook, depending on which way the ball is rotating. The dimples disturb the airflow, so that kind of effect is minimized. Uh, they could also be raised dimple, but then it's going to cause its own drag. And so depressed dimples just disturb the airflow to reduce the uh, how, strong, how powerful the slice, which is in general undesirable. Well, do you find that as an aeronautical engineer, do your knowledge make you a better golfer? No, it makes me more, I think more about why I just screwed up the last shot. <laughs> no, but I, I do under, it is, if an instructor says, well, your, your club face was too open or too closed, I understand why the results were. It hits the ball on, a, on an angle such that the friction causes it to start to spin very rapidly right off the tee. And it makes a big arc in the sky going way off the fairway. If you've got a curved fairway, it's very desirable, but a, a good golfer can induce it when he wants to and eliminate it when he... Uh, I actually put roll-on deodorant or a sunscreen on the face of my club 
to minimize the friction on impact. It works very well, and it's not illegal, and it's just cheating if you're playing for money. <laughs> and the, the next thing I had here is a follow-up on your magnetic uh, box thing. Uh, this is a little uh, cord caddy. It has a, a magnet in the center and a magnet in the center there. It's got notches on here. And this is just basically a spool. They talk together. And what it does is it, uh, uh, you can use it to um, uh, make your cord, organize your cords. So if I plug this into the wall, Wait, and Bert, this is laying Bert, on the... Yeah. Bert, yeah. Your, your inset picture is covering up the, what you're trying to show us. Yeah. Okay. So the, uh, this is just a cord caddy. It's got a magnet that holds it together. You put your cord, or your excess cord wrapped around the spool. And when you plug this into the wall, then this can just sit on your desk and you don't have a whole clutter of uh, wires and whatever. And, uh, you know, if you got three or four different uh, devices, I then, have uh, been... you got all this, all this clutter of wire. Well, this way here, you just got it in a nice little box. I have been I've looking... got this maple I have been... a walnut one. I have been looking for something like for a design like that for a long time, and I have not been able to come up with it. Thank you, Bert. Well, that's just a little spool, and like I say, the magnet fits in there. And I, I've got one that I uh, 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 did it wrong, and it won't stick together. It just sits there and floats. <laughs> and my granddaughter asked me, uh, "What's wrong with it?" And I said, "Well, that's what happens when your grandpa's an idiot, because I put the magnets <laughs> in the wrong way around." Well, I can that's tell. Just a I can tell That's you that a yo -yo with a lid. <laughs> magnets Sorry. the wrong way round is what you're going to get when you work with magnets until you learn how to manage magnets. And I'm going to do a demo on that in May for the club. And I'll make a video well, too. They, these are really handy. I gave, gave a bunch to a bunch of friends last Christmas and they just love them because it, it cl cleans up their desk. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, is that it from you today? That's it. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go back to a gallery view so I can see everybody because we're right up on the hour. So Ted, can you hang on till next week? Ted Luttrell, unmute yourself. Yes, I, I can hang on till next week. No problem. Okay. And I hope we get Roger next week and I'd like to see from more people we haven't heard from in a while. You know, Kathy Gower, you've shown us some great stuff, but we haven't seen anything from you in quite a while. What are you making these days? Bring it along next week. Um, Charlie Felson, we haven't seen much from you in a long time. Uh, you know, Jeff Carroll, uh, all you guys. Jerry Snelson, haven't heard. Uh, last time we had a slide from show from you, it blew me away completely. The work was so great. So, uh, everybody else on here who hasn't shown us anything, I'm just uh, issuing uh, the best invitation I can to bring along and show us your stuff. Uh, we have a guy, a completely new guy here I see there too, Peter uh, Misiazek. I can't pronounce it. Uh, Peter's just moved into the area and he's been belonging to a couple of other clubs and we invited him to come and check it out this week and I see he's there with his wife looking on. How are you, Peter? <laughs> You're muted. Doing well. I'm fine. Enjoying the, uh, enjoying the show this morning. Good. Glad to have you. And on that note, kids, it's 11 o'clock and so we've just uh, had another lovely hour with uh, uh, all about wood turning and wood turning tools and wood and wood turners and uh, we will see you all next week, same place. John. Thanks Take a care. lot. Man. Thanks everybody. See Thanks, you next John. week. Thank you. Thanks all. Okay. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, John. Thank you, everybody. It was great. Always is. How does that happen? Yep. It's because you guys are such good players. Wood shop. Thank God for wood. <laughs>